Good evening, everyone, or whatever time of the day it may be where you're at. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Professor Herman, um, for your kind introduction. And um, thanks, of course, to Dr. De Simone for your invitation here today. Um, old friends, and it's good to connect again. And I see many other familiar faces among the audience. Um, as Professor Herman has just mentioned, a lot of my research Buddha studies is not in this um, area that I'm talking about today. And so what I'm talking about doesn't come from what we would call field work or that kind of thing. It comes simply from the fact that these um, this Buddhist monastic education and training in Taiwan is something that I've gone through myself first as a student and then later on as uh, on the teaching end of it. Um, so it's kind of maybe a little bit different. Maybe it's something um, a little bit akin to sort of Buswell's sort of the Zen monastic experience, something like that. Okay, without any further ado, let me jump on in. I'm going to try use a PowerPoint. So it, please just give me a minute to make sure that what I'm sharing um, matches like that I just can project in there what you're seeing is what um, I think you should be seeing. So I hope you're all now looking at like a PowerPoint presentation screen. Is that correct? Can somebody just confirm that for Almost. me? Almost. It's still the, still the, oh, there you go. Well, no, no, now? no, no. Now it's in the, the screen you would see. Oh, this is, okay. maybe you can switch the primary monitor. Yeah. Okay. The usual fun here. Um, should I just duplicate these? How about that now? No, that's probably not what you want either, is it? I would I would go out of the share screen and then make sure that the, the other monitor is focused and then Okay. I How about you? No, that doesn't sharing screen is stopped because the display is unconnected. It's a good thing we practiced this beforehand. <laughs> Didn't help, did it? Um, <laughs> Okay, let's try this one here, shall we? Oh, I'll just take my screen like this. No, that won't be it either. Oh my goodness. Let me try this one. How about this? Yes, this is it. Okay, technical fun. Okay, monastic education and training in contemporary Taiwanese Buddhism. So first of all, now it should go into the next screen, but it's not even. Hello. It's not advancing. Okay, it is. Okay, so just a brief overview. We're going to talk a little bit about the Buddhist social crisis in education a century ago. Um, tai Shu's educational model um, from the mainland and how it was brought to Taiwan in the middle of last century. Um, how Buddhist colleges have become the monastic cradle, so to speak. Then we're going to have a little brief detour into um, triple platform ordination, which is part, often part of the monastic training and the college experience. We're going to talk about then the more recent shift from colleges to universities, and then talk very briefly about what happens after graduation. So first of all, a bit about the background. Um, so at the end of the Qing dynasty, uh, to 1911, so a century ago, give or take, um, there was a lot of pressure on Buddhism, Buddhism perceived as being sort of socially non-productive and so forth, and so many monasteries were being forcibly converted to schools, they had their lands and buildings confiscated and turned into schools and other civil buildings um, or functions. Uh, many Buddhist groups, or some Buddhist groups, responded by then opening Buddhist classrooms. They thought, if we run our own classrooms or our own schools, then these other, the government won't take these buildings from us because we're already doing the function they are hoping for. And they also, um, as a part of a broader picture, started to establish more Buddhist educational associations, had lay groups, um, also regular just schools for, for children and so forth. And the whole aspect of education became a greater focus on you know, what Buddhism should be doing um, in now the Republic of China. Now, one of the key figures in this process uh, was Master Taishu, um, and he called his overall sort of reform movement in Buddhism, Buddhism for human life, Renshun for Jiao. 
Um, it was partly influenced by various changes that had been made earlier in Japanese Buddhism, um, because Japanese Buddhism had already gone through sort of a renewal um, some decades before the sort of, yeah, just before, after the Meiji Restoration. But he was also partly influenced by what he saw from Western Christianity, particularly when he was in the south of China. He saw the way that Christianity was propagated, how they taught, how they adapted teachings. And Taishu also read extensively. He also read a lot about science in the West, and he had traveled also to the West as well. So he had a much broader view of um, what Buddhism, well, what he thought Buddhism should be doing in order to reform into this modern period. And a big part of that was um, education for Sangha reform. He thought, like a lot of people, sort of around the Qing, Buddhism was, particularly the Sangha, was quite a low point, and he really wanted to reform it, and he had lots of ideas about that. So here's a picture of Taishu. This is um, a memorial um, for the Minnan Buddhist College, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Now, what was Taishu's program for monastic education reform? Um, so education was going to be a key part to restructure the entire Chinese Sangha. Um, there would be secular education, but run by Buddhist organizations. So just like regular ordinary schools teaching regular secular subjects for children and so forth, which is part of a you know, broader movement within the whole country to you know, um, reach universal literacy and, and so on and so forth. Um, but a, a more important issue for the Buddhist community was religious education for Sangin. So some of, just some of Taishu's ideas um, was he required um, secondary or higher education in order to then reach ordination. So he sort of wanted basic levels of education um, among new members to the Sangha. He proposed a system of 12 years of monastic education um, before a monastic could then go on and become a teacher. This was um, largely inspired by systems in place in Japan as well. And so he and his followers had some success. Um, so in 1922, um, Taishu was the head of the Wuchang Buddhist College, which he had just set up. Um, a few years after this, he served as the dean of the Minnan Buddhist College. This is in Fujian, so which is now on the now and then on the east coast of China, not, not too far, sort of halfway between Shanghai and, and Hong Kong, approximately. Um, in the 30s, during the war, um, when they all moved um, into, into central China, because of course all down the coast there was just a, a war zone. He set up the Sino-Tibetan Institute in Chongqing, and there was some um, greater connections made there with some forms of Tibetan Buddhism, which others such as Nanghai, for example, followed up with. Um, but despite all these, his hopes were largely unfulfilled for a couple of reasons. One was just simply um, the war against the Japanese from 31 to 45. And immediately after this was then the civil war um, between the Republicans and the communists. And Taishu himself passed away in 1947. So sort of in the middle of the civil war. So, you know, you've got all these plans um, of what you want to do to reform the Sangha through education. But when the country is at war for almost two decades, of course, things are going to be very difficult. Um, but Taishu's educational model was passed on to Taiwan. And so let's have a look at this now. So first of all, the Buddhist Association of the Republic of China, the BAROC, which um, Taishu was involved in there in the mainland, um, that was already established in the mainland quite early on. So it was formed in 1911, but it moved to Taiwan with the nationalists, the Kuomintang, KMT or the um, GMD, if you prefer, um, in 1949, at the end of the Civil War, and re-established there. Um, and meanwhile, in the mainland, um, some of Taishu's followers um, who remained in the mainland set up the Buddhist Association of China there. So at this point, you've sort of got what, what happens in China and what happens in Taiwan. They go slightly different ways, even though this BAROC was a common route for what happened in, on both the mainland and in Taiwan. Now, there were some of Taishu's, you say, colleagues, but also some of his students 
um, that went with the uh, nationalist government and the military and so forth to Taiwan. So one of these figures was Si Han, who's a friend and follower of Taishu. And in Taiwan, he helped set up a couple of Buddhist colleges in the 40s and 50s, such as the Ling Chen and Si San. Um, another influential figure was In Shun, who was in some ways a student, but in many ways also just considered a sort of a junior colleague of Taishu. Um, he was well known for his, his scholarship and his um, erudition and, and the canons and so forth, um, even when he was already in the mainland. And he also helped to set up Buddhist colleges from the 50s, such as Fu Yin and um, Hui Ri Jiang Tan and so forth. He was granted um, a PhD in Buddhist studies from Taishu University. He didn't study there. This was based on a book that he'd written about um, Chinese Chan and um, after he'd written this and it was shown to people at Taishu University and they said, this is good enough to, to grant somebody a, um, a doctoral degree. That actually might be a DLIT, not a PhD. I might be wrong in that regard, um, in the 70s. So um, Inshun was another one of these colleagues of the similar generation to Taishu that came over to Taiwan, bringing along some of um, Taishu's ideals. And they then continued with Taishu's ideas of education and Sangha reform in Taiwan. But there was also a new generation that was coming along as well. And so along with all these, you know, the, the number of refugees coming from the mainland to Taiwan um, from, you know, mainly through the 50, I mean, it's numbering in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And so there were also some other young monks the generation after Taishu that came to Taiwan at this time as well. Many of them first, oh, typo, many of them were first within this um, BAROC organization because this was pretty much the only Buddhist sort of national level organization at this time. Um, but as some of these people then developed their own, you know, their own style and their own teaching and they, they gathered their own influence, several of them went independent um, from the 60s and particularly the 70s onwards. So one of them, is um, Xin Yun, um, who was, we could say like a follower of Taishu, wasn't a direct student, but was heavily inspired by Taishu's writings and his whole modernist spirit. Um, in the 60s, um, so he's still, as you can see, just in his 30s, he set up Buddhist College in Shoshan, which is kind of central Taiwan. And then in the late 60s, he established for Guangshan Monastery um, down the south of Taiwan. And within that, um, and really early on, one of the very first um, buildings set up within Fengshan Monastery was the Tsonglin Buddhist University in 1967. Now, note in its English formal name is Buddhist University, but it is what I'm referring to in this talk as a college. Okay, so just to clarify that term there. Another important figure in this younger generation was um, Sheng Yan, who was a student of Dong Chu, who was also like a colleague um of Taishu as well um he went to I mean he was ordained when he was quite young but he disrobed to join the army uh, when he was still in the mainland served in the military came to Taiwan disrobed later again entered monastic life and in the 70s he went and studied in Japan um, both studying Zen um meditation, but also getting his own PhD in Buddhist studies as well, or I should say doctorate degree in Buddhist studies. And he established Dharma Dharma Monastery um, in 93. So this is quite a bit later than um, for Wan Shan, but before he set up Dharma Dharma himself, he had also been heavily involved in various aspects of, of teaching and so forth in Taiwan. Now these were just two figures. There are some other figures, but these are particularly two figures that we can trace a line from the mainland through Taishu and Taishu's group, and then coming over to Taiwan around this period of time. So this is um, Dongfang for Jiao Xue Yuan. This is um, within Foguangshan. Um, the, this is part of the Tsonglin Buddhist University. OK, so let's look at these Buddhist colleges as what I'm going to call the monastic cradle. Um, so I've been using this term Buddhist college because this is, for most, many of these Okay, so the Chinese term is this a Fu Xue Yuan. Um, and the standard English term that these organizations themselves use is usually college. So I'm using that. 
I think probably a more accurate term might be to think of it as a seminary. Um, so when I'm using the term college in this regard, think of like a seminary, right? A place for training monastics. Um, so the main role is as a seminary, they have a, a basic program, which is modeled on this kind of like a seminary as a training as like a BA degree, but we're going to talk about that. It is not a formally recognized BA degree. Um, probably within Taiwan, I'd say perhaps 75% or greater um, number of monastics have trained in one of these colleges. They haven't necessarily gone through a full three or four year program, but the vast majority of monastics have. So that's kind of like a basic training, shall we say. Um, and they have a range of associated programs as well. So while the, the basic Buddhist college for sure in training, your standard training, um, some of the larger Buddhist colleges might also have an attached Buddhist research institute, Yin Zhou Suo, or Yin Shou Xue Yuan, or some other term like that. And that's kind of modeled on an MA degree, again, not accredited. Um, they might, in some of the larger monasteries, have something which is called like a Chan Studies College, which is basically the idea that then junior monastics can go and study Chan meditation, but as students. So that there is training in this under the tutelage of senior Chan uh, meditating monastics. And even fewer yet, but there have been a few, like a novitiate school um, for... Um, I've not heard of one for Shramanirikas, but I've heard of one for Shramaniras, so the novice monks. Um, these were around mainly in the 90s, but I don't know if there's any still operating now in Taiwan. So this was for these, you know, youths, maybe age 12, 13, 14, and they would have, they would, their parents would want to, them to study in the Buddhist college, but they still hadn't finished high school and you still have compulsory education. So they would live in that environment, still get their high school education while they're also getting their monastic education at the same time. Now, as just mentioned, none of these are accredited uh, with the Taiwan Ministry of Education. So while they give out degrees and they give out diplomas, which are often recognized by other Buddhist organizations, even elsewhere in the world, but not as formal degrees. Um, at present, there's over about 35 such colleges all over the country. Um, some of them are very small, some of them are quite large. So let's just talk about some of this, the structure of these. Um, so first of all, you have to talk about the relationship with the supporting monastery. So usually requires quite a large monastery to run a college because not just have the buildings, but you're then putting in resources to train up monastics rather than doing things that would usually work for the economic survival of a monastery, right? So it needs to be a fairly large monastic organization with funds to be able to run such a, a program. Um, but there are definitely some monasteries where the college is, is very much a main focus. So for example, if we talk about the traditions left behind by In Shun, they do have um, elements which aren't just the colleges per se, but it's very much the colleges are one of the big focuses. And there's some other examples as well. The dean of the college is typically the abbot or the abbess of the monastery. Um, but it can be, I won't say name only, but they are not necessarily involved in the day-to-day -day running um, of, of the college. So some of the larger organizations may have a full-time dean that's not just sort of a name only. And there might also be a vice dean or a rector for day-to-day -day running, particularly if the official dean is like the abbot or abbess who, you know, literally might see once a month or something <laughs> in the actual um, college grounds. They tend to then break up the structures. They have um, what they'd call our academic affairs, um, jiao wu, our student affairs, shui wu, and they might have a general affairs, zong wu, um, though that might be under student affairs. So basically the academic affairs does the teaching side of things, um, the student affairs then looks after the students and includes other elements of the education outside of the classroom. And general affairs looks after the buildings and supplies and all that kind of thing. Um, if we look at the people involved, the teaching faculty and the students, just two basic categories. Um, most of the teaching faculty are monastics, particularly for the doctrinal scriptural classes and the teaching of liturgy. Uh, many of these monastics will have MA degrees, 
but some of those MA degrees might be from within these unaccredited um, Buddhist college programs or Buddhist research institute programs. Um, and many of the monastics themselves will come from the same monastic tradition. That will vary a lot depending on some organizations, typically the bigger organizations, so such as um, Fogwanshan or Dharma Drum, can, can largely staff their own teaching faculty with monastics who have been ordained within their own traditions, but some of the smaller ones, not so much. Um, only some of them are full time, um, but because many of these, let's say, if most of the, of the monastics, they might teach a particular class every semester or something like that, but they might also have another function within the monastery that they do as well. Um, but the but the colleges will have a couple of full time teachers. And they might also, they will almost certainly have lay teachers as well for other specialist studies, languages. Um, this might include um, scholars, lay scholars and professors from, from universities who might come in and give like you know, a specialist class on a particular topic. And usually that scholar will have a close association with the monastic organization, um, but also for other things as well. Um, some of the general education classes, languages, um, computer studies and that kind of thing are often lay teachers. And they will also have um, senior resident and visiting monastics give talks and lectures that might not be a class, like a, you know, like a weekly, every, you know, every Tuesday morning at nine o'clock type class, but sort of guest speakers as well, um, which are, tend to be less academic, shall we say, and more like, these are Dharma talks. The students typically range in age from 18 to 35. Um, and some places do have like a, an age cut off, at least in theory. Um, students typically have to be, well, have to be single and not just single, but often unmarried. So in the case of somebody who had been married, um, they might have to have a little talk and chat to people whether or not they could, you know, actually be allowed into the program. Um, but for both of these, I think because they're unaccredited and then these things are like guidelines, shall we say. They're not absolute rules, and so all sorts of allowances can be made because of the flexibility um, that these Buddhist colleges have. Most students are female, so this is just, I mean, Buddhism in Taiwan in general, 75% um, plus, it could be higher. Um, though typically if a college, uh, there are some colleges that will split like the the men's program and the women's program and the classes are kept separate so of course on the male side it's male the female side is female and in case you're wondering how do they deal with issues such as transgender students that's a really good question that's a really good question and i haven't seen any formal or official policy on that and probably most groups in taiwan will be in the category of they don't want to make formal statements on such matter which itself is already a bit of a statement. Now, students in Taiwan um, can be lay or monastic. And this is one of the changes. Um, Taishu himself, Buddhist colleges were for monastics. So you'd have to be transferred to come in. But in Taiwan, most of them, they open it up. So you come in as, as a lay student first. Um, but they might also have monastics from other smaller monasteries that don't have their own colleges. Um, and so smaller monasteries are often have a, like a, a friendly connection, it's called Yol Si, with a larger monastery. And then the smaller monastery, when they get um, people that want to ordain into their own tradition and their own monastery and their own teachers, they send them to the larger monastery with its um, Buddhist college for their training. And when they're graduated, then they go back to their home monastery. Um, students mainly Taiwanese Chinese this might not actually apply um, they were in the past but nowadays large numbers of Malaysian students um, Hong Kong Singaporean again mostly Chinese but not exclusively um, and this is related also to just uh, lower birth rates in Taiwan and also that the Taiwan model has become a model for um, the greater Chinese Buddhist sphere in general um, but students from the Public Republic of China cannot come and study in these. <laughs> many would, many, many would, but they cannot at present. They, they can't hold that kind of status and do that. Um, admissions and programs. So like I said, 
um, there were a few novice programs. Um, so for those who would still be at like high school age, kind of sent by their parents largely, though there's not to say that they're reluctant. <laughs> they're often very keen on it. Um, and so that program would include the standard high school education, but in a monastic context as well. Um, the regular college program, as I said, students age 18 to 35 enter as laity. Most programs about three years or four years. Um, though you can get this kind of like early graduation thing. Sometimes um, students, you know, maybe a student who's 30 years old and has already had a lot of contact with Buddhism. They've done a lot of their own studies. They've, they've been to all sorts of classes at, at temples for five or 10 years. Um, they go into the college and after a year, they realize that look, the student already has been molded into what we what we want as a monastic. There's no need for them to stay at the college. Let's get them out there and doing something else for the rest of the community. Um, and as I said, some students are already ordained, ordained from allied monasteries. Now, in the case for older students, 35 to 40, or maybe even older, they might get kind of like a short stay at the monastery, just go in there for like basic training. And then, um, or maybe they don't even get that. They might be tonsured and then sent off to work at some other monastic department, usually in line with what their secular experience was. So let's say if they were originally uh, an electrician in their lay life and they wanted to become a monk, okay, sure, basic training. And then they might work in the monastery as someone who's responsible for looking after the, you know, electrician stuff and trades work within the monastery. So they don't get that much training as you know, in terms of scripture or the like. Okay, now let's look at the curriculum. There's a, a couple of aspects here and I've broken this up into discipline and practicum. That's like one category. And the other one is what I'm gonna call academic curriculum. Um, and then this one again too, these are like closely related, but they're not academic. So just note that when I'm, when I'm talking about like curriculum, I'm not just talking about classroom curriculum, what classes do they do? It's far broader. So. Discipline, you know, it's training for monastic life. And so it's a very disciplined seminary lifestyle. Um, some have even called it militaristic. And there's a reason partly for that. And I mean, since the Civil War and the nationalist government in Taiwan, even up until the present, there's been compulsory military training for young men. The time is getting shorter and shorter. But what it's meant then is that particularly on the, the male side, and of course that heavily influences also the woman's side as well, the sort of army style barracks training, um, how you fold your, your duvet, how you line your toothbrush in your cup and your toothpaste and sit it on the bench and it's gotta be facing exactly the right way. Being on time, being prompt, these things that you know, it's military style in many ways. Heavy emphasis on community activity. Um, you really have to, you know, not much room for sort of personal circumstances. Um, everyone's treated equally, or in a sense that we could say, um, yeah, this is breaking down of sort of this individualistic, headstrong attitude. And there are various systems of award and punishment, um, and everything will be graded. Lots of little things in life get graded in order to shape one into this model of being a monastic. Um, punishment. Um, now in Taiwan, I think very few, if any places, use any kind of um, corporal punishment or any striking or anything like that. Um, but being told to go to the main shrine and kneel down and repent, um, things like that are still very common. So the practicum side of what they're doing um, every day, so morning and evening chanting and or meditation, uh, daily cleaning of the college dorms and the grounds, this is very just like chupo, just like um, monastic work, cleaning, a lot of cleaning work, and also service in the monastery. So service in the kitchen, service in the dining halls and the grounds um, on a kind of day-to-day week-to-week -to -week basis and also assisting the monastery with larger monastic programs and this is very much part of their training right the, the learning to be a monastic it's not just in the classroom a lot of what monastics do all sorts of activities there's a you know the there's some large um, event going on with um, you know lay devotees and so on and so forth so the students go on and they serve in some role and as they go through the years at the, at the college they might get slowly 
more responsibility. And so by the time they graduate, they already have some experience with these various um, larger monastic programs and activities. Now on the academic curricular side, um, I've just made some like arbitrary categories here because I mean, there's so many colleges and I can't, I can't take them all and tell you they all have this, this is their, you know, the classes that they teach because there's a lot of variation. And as I said, these are not standardized because there's no like overarching accreditation system at all. So there can be a fair bit of variation, but here are some general kind of principles. Something at the core, we might have classes on like life of the Buddha, particularly like first year, um, life and teachings of the founder, so, you know, if you're at Dharma Drum, you're going to get classes on, you know, the thought of Master Sung Yen or, you know, the Chan teachings of Master Sung Yen. And modern languages, um, English and Japanese in particular, um, will, these kind of classes will go through, you know, all the years and everyone will have to go through these types of things at some point. Scripture, of course, um, that might be paired with history, history of Indian Buddhism, history of Chinese Buddhism, two common ones. Um, there is an interesting, I mean, this is heavily influenced by Inshun, um, Agama studies, so early Buddhist scripture, which, you know, textbooks will tell you Chinese Buddhism is Mahayana, and it is, but they also do have groups that will, a lot of groups that will study early scripture and Chinese translation, of course, Mahayana scripture, and also Chinese scripture. So this can be, um, this can be Tiantai texts, it could be Chan school texts, it could be Pure Land texts as well. And some of the more academically inclined Buddhist um, colleges will also have some scriptural languages. Um, Pali is probably one of the most um, popular ones. It might be a bit of Sanskrit, might be a bit of Pibet. Some places, not many. There will also be classes in admin um, that might include like monastic management and event management. Um, and we could maybe call it another category of like propagation. So public speaking, learning to run um, specific events related to, you know, teaching the Dharma and propagating the Dharma. Because of course, this is a, an important role for many, if not all monastics once they graduate. And of course, liturgy, which is another real staple of um, monastic life. So first they'll learn like the daily chanting services. So your morning chanting, evening chanting, your dining hall chanting. Um, and then once those are mastered, in including like not just chanting, but also playing the different Dharma instruments, larger services. Um, so repentance services, um, great compassion, repentance. Um, then larger ones still, the Emperor Liang repentance, which takes literally a week to perform. And then maybe other further roles. They probably won't get to really do things such as the water and land function. Those will be left for well-graduated monastics to learn those types of things. But this is where they learn the basics, um, which they will be using once they graduate. Um, I kind of didn't know whether to put this earlier, but entry into the Sangha. <laughs> um, so this is kind of back to the question of like the students. Um, Oh, sorry, I, I, sorry, 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 my apologies. Um, this isn't entry into the college itself, but this is, as I said, so most students come in as lay students, um, but um, as through this process, many of them will be interested in wanting to become monastics. Um, and so we, most of them then tonsure and ordain while they are students. Um, and also there will be not just those monastics within the monastery itself, but those from the so-called allied monasteries. Um, they maintain their original monastic teacher and affiliation. Um, they apply to enter the Sangha during their study at the college. Um, this might take place six monthly or annually. They are usually then the college teachers assess them whether they're suitable for ordination. And then it gets approved by senior monastics and the abbot and so forth. And there'll be tons of ceremonies for small groups of students, a batch at a time, but this isn't the full ordination. Um, so once they're tons then they just continue in the college, but now they are shaved head and in monastic robes uh, rather than lay students. So here we go here. Um, time's getting short, so I need to really pick up the pace. The, many monasteries will also have short-term monastic retreats. And so some of these students might then participate in the short-term monastic retreats 
taking the precepts at the start, but unlike everyone else, they don't return or disrobe at the end of the seven days. They keep then their novice ordination um, afterwards. So now they have also not just tonsil, but they've also received their um, novice precept, novice precepts um, within this event, even though the short-term monastic retreat is finished. Here we go here, this is a symbolic tonsuring from Malaysia. And then I've got a long section here, which I was going to skip over very briefly anyway. So the triple platform ordination, this is a standard um, Chinese system here. So ordination is not a one day event. It, it takes place over several weeks. And most of the large, only a couple of large monasteries in Taiwan can run this themselves. Most monasteries team up with other monasteries in order to run it because they're very large events. They take many weeks and they take hundreds of preceptees for the event and they require many senior monastics as the preceptors from the Upajaya to the Acharyas, um, but also many monastic support staff. So you need a big organization to be able to run this. They get training, they get ritual training, they get training in the very precepts that they're taking. Um, and it's a time where this kind of the discipline is pulled up another notch. So the strictness and the very high demands on their sort of monastic deportment and behavior. So you go kneeling, kneeling on the concrete under the hot Australian sun. That's in Australia. Here's all the precept doors. And this just very briefly going through there. These willow ones symbolize the discipline and various aspects of the novice ordination and various aspects of the Bhikshu and Bhikshuni ordination, batch at a time. This is the Simma. And then the Bodhisattva ordination. The burning of the incense marks on the crown. And then after the ordination, where they receive donations from the laity. Um, I'm just looking at time here. I don't know how much time I've got left. Um, so just a, a, an, another note on higher education. So as I said, many of the larger colleges also have their own postgraduate research institutes. Um, there's 10 of those. So I said like over 35 colleges and then about maybe 10 or more of these sort of MA level programs in Taiwan. Um, some of them also have a PhD equivalent, um, again, unaccredited. And these are usually then restricted to the top college graduates. Um, and this is usually selected then by the teachers. You can't just say you want to do it if the monastery says, um, no, you can't do it, then um, you can't do it usually. So you have to be a very high performing student and not just in your, in your academic skills, shall we say, but you know, if you were very good at your scriptural studies, but you didn't have the good behavior of a proper monastic, probably the monastery might, might be a bit reluctant to let a student into one of these MA or PhD equivalent programs as well. Um, okay, not accredited. So let's talk a little about the faculty and curricula of these here. Um, it's pretty similar here. Um, so here, maybe we have like a greater number of the teachers are lay teachers, and most of them have MAs and PhDs from accredited universities. Um, and many of them are also again, adjunct faculty at other institutions. So somebody might be, um, or they might be a full-time teacher at a, a university somewhere teaching Buddhist studies, or they could be teaching Chinese literature, but also um, have a strong interest in Buddhism and Chinese Buddhist scripture, and then are invited by the monastery's research institute to come and teach a course in some particular Chinese scripture. Um, they also have practical elements as well, research methods, they learn about Buddhist schools and sects, Indian Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, and some have Tibetan Buddhism, but not so much. And of course, the language training that goes with these. So these are you know, as I said, they're not accredited, um, but there are some of these programs that in terms of what I'd call like traditional scholarship, they do produce some good work. You know, some of these, um, in, particularly in terms of the, the work with Chinese Buddhist traditions and Chinese Buddhist scriptures and schools and so forth. They might not be accredited, but there are definitely some scholars, 
some monastic scholars that come out of them that really know their really know their scriptures and their doctrinal traditions. That's for sure. Um, now the question of academic accreditation. So before two thousand and six, um, universities could have like religious studies programs, and then you know fully accredited religious studies program at a university. Um, and that's it, whether it's a, a, like a state-run university or if it's a private-run university. Um, and, you know, as religious studies, it's that sort of more comparative religious studies. You couldn't just focus on, say, Buddhist studies or Buddhism. It had to be religion in general. But from 2006, the Ministry of Education allowed a department at a university to have, uh, sorry, a university to have a department that specializes in a single religion. Um, so this is kind of more like a school of theology or a school of divinities, shall we say. Um, and so um, because they're then within these accredited universities, they then require university level educational standards. And so that's been a major shift for some of the large orders that have their own colleges. Um, so some universities also took up this opportunity and pretty much they are the biggest of the big Buddhist monastic organizations that already had fully accredited universities. So earlier on, they would have fully accredited university and it might have a program in religious studies, but now they could set up a program that's specifically for like Buddhology or Buddhist studies. Most of the universities that have these programs are Buddhist, um, but there are some other ones as well. Um, and interestingly enough, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the Catholic Church chose not to do this, even though they could have, um, partly because once it's then at a university level, um, your ability to then maintain things such as doctrinal orthodoxy, um, you can't just run it how the church would want to run it. Um, you can't fire, for example, a faculty member for being unorthodox um, because that would be, you know, inappropriate grounds for sacking someone due to their religious beliefs. So once you've moved it from the, the monastery or the church into then the university, of course, and all those other secular standards um, then hold, um, whereas the, the colleges that are run in the monasteries themselves have this great flexibility um, because they don't have to follow these sort of standards that are set up by the Ministry of Education. So some of these include uh, Fakwang University, which set up a college and department of Buddhist studies, which has BA, MA and PhD degrees. Uh, Huafan University was originally established in two, uh, 1990, and they set up later on after 2006, a uh, college and department of Buddhist studies, which focuses on Tiantai um, traditions at BA level. Um, Dharmadram Institute of Le so it should be not Library Arts Institute of Liberal Arts, spell checker. Um, now, they are not a university, but they are accredited. This is technical detail. They're not a university because they don't have enough colleges within the university, but they have a, the degrees that they issue are accredited degrees. They're just not called a university, but they're still accredited. And there are some other Buddhist universities also that don't have Buddhist studies, such as Nanhua University, also run by Foguan Shan. Um, Siji University, they have just like religion, and they also have, of course, medicine. Uh, Shenzhen University, they also have Department of Religious Studies. So these last three are not this category that I'm talking about here. Just these first ones, where it's basically like a monastic Buddhist college in a university. But of course, there are going to be some issues here. So here's Dharmadram, this is a very new campus here. The, the actual main monastery is off, Dharmadram main monastery is off to the right. Can't really see it here. Very new campus. Um, just to give you one example. Um, and there are all sorts of issues with these. So there's this big question of, so let's say if you're Dharmadram or Foguan Shan, you've got your own traditional Buddhist college and then you've got this program within a university, which you can also model like on a Buddhist college as well. It means you don't just have academic programs. You can also make demands on the student's lifestyle. You can, you can have morning and evening chanting as part of the requirement to complete the program. Um, you can have you know, learning of liturgy and so forth that we normally wouldn't think as part of a 
religious studies program or a Buddhist studies program, um, maybe at Ghent or at Oxford, but under this 2006 Ministry of Education um, law, they can. But then this means a decision by organizations such as Fogwan Shine and Dharma Drum. They're then running two programs that are almost like parallel programs, and that's splitting their resources, but each have got their own strengths and, um, strengths and weaknesses. So after graduation, um, monastics take up various roles within the monastery organization. Um, larger monasteries still have continued education, at least for junior and mid-level monastics. Um, for example, need for administrative training, management systems, accounting, legal systems, etc. And a lot of these roles are then filled by monastics with pre-ordination qualifications. So, for example, if you if you go into the monasteries, you know, into their accounts department, um, you can pretty much guarantee that the monastics who are working there, they will have monastics, all have degrees in accounting and so forth that they got when they were um, lay students in their younger days before they ordained. But as I said, there's some some crucial balances here. So this traditional versus modern monastic education. So um, the religious training versus the administrative side. Monasteries do have a lot of administrative things that they need to do. And, you know, without those things, the monastery will not function very well versus just the purely, you know, we're going to study scripture, we're going to meditate. So how to balance these. And then this is kind of this balance between the Buddhist colleges, which are run within the monasteries for monastic training versus these programs at departments of Buddhist studies at universities, which give accredited degrees. But the expectations um, of university students compared to those aspirants and postulants in a monastery are quite different. And so how to balance these two, you know, do we need two different programs like this? Or um, I don't think they've quite found the, the sweet spot yet of how to balance these two, mainly because the second category is quite new. Um, and we can say that the, the, the Buddhist College versus Department of Buddhist Studies is really kind of a case of religious education versus religious studies. Um, and so among these, you've got the sort of balance between monastic and lay expectations. Of course, at the monastery, it's going to be, you know, vegetarianism, no alcohol, um, single, unmarried, you're under constant sort of 24-7, you're, you're working for the monastery. Um, but then students at a Department of Buddhist Studies at a university, you know, should they be vegetarian? Do they, you know, should, should they have rules where they cannot take alcohol, for example? Um, do they have to be single to study at a university? So there's all sorts of other issues here because, you know, just the rights as a student, um, one cannot discriminate against a student on the grounds of their you know, their status in marriage or, or whatever. Um, but then that's quite a different situation to what was already traditionally applied within the Buddhist colleges. So, you know, how are these two going to work out is kind of a big, a big question. And as I said, they're still working on how to do this. Okay. That's a lot of talk from me. Um, I need to unshare my oh, I need to unshare my screen here. Okay, is that unshared? Sure. Yeah. Thank sure. you very much. Okay. Sorry, that was quite long. Oh no. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. No problem. Get a clap. Um. So let's have questions.